Uh, so that said, I'm super excited to announce the next speaker. Uh, traditionally, we have Nicolas Sernin uh, as the first speaker after the opening session. And I'm very happy that he is here also uh, joining us at the Things Virtual Conference. Uh, Nicolas is one of the inventors of the LoRa technology and is CTO of Semtech. Today, he's going to talk about Semtech's latest and greatest silicon and services. So here's for you, uh, Nicolas streaming live uh, from the center of France. I didn't know uh, France had a desert, but uh, Nicolas says he's there. Um, so uh, here he is. We have time for questions after, uh, so we are monitoring the YouTube uh, YouTube chat. And uh, so if you have any questions, please uh, put them there and uh, we have the opportunity to ask Nicola live after his talk. So Nicola, please uh, take it from here and uh, thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you, Johan, so much for the introduction. Thank you for uh, inviting us to present to this uh, first virtual conference. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Just tell me if you can see it. Is this okay, Jan? Yes, this is all good. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to get started. So, hey, I'm Nicolas, I'm City of Semtech, as uh, Johan said, uh, broadcasting live from the center of France, effectively, today. Uh, this is pretty unusual exercise for me. Uh, so today I want to talk about uh, the new LR1110, uh, which is our, our latest silicon, which is going in production right now. Uh, and this is a pretty unusual chip, as you will see. So uh, for us, this is a very, very ambitious chip uh, for many different reasons. Uh, and I'm going to go progressively through all of this during this presentation. Uh, so the uh, this chip represents more than three years of work from all the teams inside uh in the semtech so it's probably like 40 50 people during three years um it's not your usual um uh, lora transceiver it's extremely different from everything we've done before uh first you'll see also full-blown sdr so software defined radio uh, it uses a uh, heavily customized um, DSP core uh, with custom-made accelerators in hardware, and I'll talk about all that later. Uh, and also, for the first time, the chip by itself uh, is not everything. The, some of the services uh, or so of the features delivered by the chip, so typically the geolocation, uh, the, you know, the Wi-Fi scanning and GNSS uh, scanning, to operate, they actually need a cloud service. And I will explain why. So this is why we call this chip actually a, a solution, because it's not just silicon. For the first time, it's silicon and associated cloud services supporting some of the silicon functionalities. So inside, okay, on this chip, on the silicon side, you don't have you, your usual transceiver. You, um, you have actually a full-blown software-defined radio, and I will go through that later. Um, so at functionality delivered, you have the sub gigahertz uh, LoRa transceiver, pretty much with a few modifications you will see, but what you were used to see in our previous chips. Uh, on top of that, you have a Wi-Fi sniffer, which is used for indoor-outdoor geolocation purposes. And the chip can also be used to perform uh, multi-constellation GNSS scanning for outdoor location. Uh, what's also pretty unusual compared to our um, uh, to a usual uh, RF transceiver is that uh, to to support those functionalities you need some associated cloud services. So, for example, both for uh, Wi-Fi geolocation and GNSS constellation, part of the processing is actually delivered by a cloud service. So this is why we call that chip a solution. Um, it's to operate it. It's both silicon on the device and some processing engine somewhere in the cloud that's required to deliver the complete functionality and that's um, that's fairly new okay so uh, how do you integrate that chip in your solution this is how you uh, use the chip as a transceiver and we'll see that there are, you know there will be in the future many different options so uh, as a transceiver, you run your um, uh, host application and, for example, LoRa one stack on on, um, on your host processor. You connect through SPI to the chip as usual. 
the chip as an integrated DC DC converter for power, for a power supply and automatic power supply management. Uh, it has the usual 32 megahertz crystal. Uh, what's new is it also has a secondary crystal oscillator for 32 kilohertz timekeeping crystal. Um, a sense of time is very important for a GNSS receiver uh, as this receiver needs to be able to predict accurately where the satellites are in the sky and for that it needs to keep track of time. But we'll go in more detail later. Uh, last point is it has very flexible uh, GPIO switch matrix to allow automatic control of any combination of RF switches on the various uh, RF inputs of the chip. The, um, the same chip uh, may be used uh, in the future as a, a LoRa1 modem uh, through a firmware upgrade, we'll see that. In which case, actually, in that scheme, your uh, OST MCU uh, only runs the application code, whatever you want to write, and what defines the behavior of your sensor, of your device. Uh, and the uh, LR1110 not only delivers um, the geolocation capabilities, but also a full LoRa1 network stack. And I'll come back to that later also. The... Um, um, uh, sorry, let me get back an instant to this. Sorry, I forgot something. Um, when I say this chip integrates or can integrate a LoRa1 modem, I want to spend a minute here uh, talking about the differences between a LoRa1 modem and just a stack. So modem in in our words at Semtech is, is very different from a stack. It's a, a certified LoRa1 stack, but on top of that, it includes all the basic utility services that any LoRa1 device should implement anyway at the application layer. So, for example, um, a Keep Alive uh, packet. So, the modem is you can configure it to autonomously send a Keep Alive frame every day, every week, every hour, whatever um, periodicity you want. This is simply to make sure that the device is still connected to the network, that you can still receive it. It's in that keep alive frame. We also have, you know, the number of reset, the uptime of the chip, the voltage of the battery, all those things that actually it's very useful to know. Um, but many device manufacturers forget to put in their devices. Uh, a modem, for example, will periodically check the connectivity to the network, and after a preset time, will automatically rejoin if it lost the the connectivity to a network. Uh, in the modem, we also have um, a, a file upload capability. So a way to very efficiently fragment a file and upload it with redundancy to uh, to the network or to your application server. It uh, implements automatic uh, clock synchronization. So the the onboard clock is synchronized to the network clock and will always be on time, which is a crucial feature for um, GNSS navigation. Um, it's uh, it can remotely be rekeyed, for example. You can remotely reset it and get it to join another network. So there are actually a modem is much more than stack. There are many additional functionalities that come on top of the stack, which are part of this modem. Uh, last point, and we'll talk about that later. It has an integrated crypto engine, which integrates all the LoRa One compliant crypto and, and key derivations. Uh, so this chip brings an element of security when you're using it for a LoRa1 network connection. Can you still hear me, uh, Johan? Yes, we're all good. Thank you. Okay. Continue. So let me yeah. continue. Um, so here I'm going to spend a minute describing the life cycle of the chip. So. When the chip leaves a factory, the Semtech factory, it's always configured with a base image, which is always the same, which is base transceiver. So the LR1110 base transceiver, which which corresponds to the data sheet you can find on our website today. Um, the crypto engine of the chip is also pre-provisioned with a unique chip serial number, which we call a chip UI, a, a default Dev UI, so this is a LoRa1 Dev UI, which is by default equal to chip UI, and some diversified keys. So when I say diversified, I mean an app key and a network key, which are unique for every device we produce. Those keys are, of course, at the same time simultaneously stored into our joint server for later network joint process. 
the keys the chip is then pushed to distribution channel to arrow future digikey farnel whatever uh, it's purchased by an oem or device manufacturer that the device manufacturer can do a few things it can first optionally upgrade so if the device plans to use for example the modem version of the chip and not the transceiver the the chip is reflashed by the oem to upgrade it to for example modem functionality so the oem will have the capability to replace a firmware image which is running on board the lr1110 chip it can also optionally override the dev ui and key so if you don't want to use the pre-provisioned dev ui or the pre-provisioned keys you can put your own dev ui or your own keys or both in the crypto engine and finally last but not least uh, it is really recommended to upgrade the almanac file so the almanac is what is the data is a set of data that allows the chip to predict where the gnss or the gps satellites are in the sky at a given time that almanac is valid for three months so we do put a default almanac in in fab but actually by the time the chip reaches the oem that almanac is probably out of date so it is good practice to actually upgrade the almanac with the latest almanac file and that almanac file is provided every a new almanac file will be provided by semtech every month then the chip is you know soldered to the pcb and you can basically sell the device uh, on the market the chip a very important point of this chip uh, or limitation if you want is the chip is not designed to run the user's code the chip only runs semtech signed firmware image which defines the functionality of the chip um, so why is it this way uh, the 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 dsp or the the controller which is at the heart of the lr1110 is really highly customized it's not a standard uh, processor at all uh, it's been customized to perform very efficient uh, digital signal processing capabilities uh, therefore, the development environment is not user friendly at all. There are bits and pieces of assembly language around. Uh, it's designed to be highly real time when we are doing a Wi-Fi or GPS operations. So, so the the only way we could actually, you know, uh, uh, be able to run users code would be to put a second core, uh, which we have decided not to do at this stage because the requirement for different applications are extremely diverse. So. With the LR1110, an external host MCU will still be required to run the user's code uh, or the user's uh, application. And uh, and we will collect, you know, requirement from the various uh, uh, use case. So we may go in the direction of including another core in the future. The decision is not taken and the LR1110 certainly cannot run your, your application code. It's very important to, to get this limitation. I'm now getting to the, the radio part. This is what I feel comfortable about. I'm a, I'm a radio guy. I'm not a, a digital software guy. Uh, so this chip is real, is real best. Uh, the main originality. So as you see, the chip has a 2.4 gigahertz input pass. This is for Wi-Fi scanning. Uh, it has two LNAs or two input paths which can cover continuously from 100 megahertz to 2.7 uh, gigahertz. Zoos are the um, the input that we use for LoRa subgig and for GNSS uh, scanning, for example. But as you understand, we can do a lot more things with this, given the frequency range covered here. And we have two PAs, one optimized for low power and one optimized for high power, which can uh, work in the in, at any frequency between 150 to 950 megahertz. The main originality of that radio architecture, as you see you know, directly, is all those bands are covered by a single radios. There is a single PLL, just a single ADC, there's a single configurable digital baseband there. So it's an extremely flexible and efficient architecture. Uh, but one of the limitations that comes from that is operation on those different bands are mutually exclusive. You cannot demodulate a Wi-Fi packet as you're using the GPS input or when you're doing LoRa operation in the, on the subgig pass, because there's only a single ADC and a single PLL. Okay, so it's one thing at a time, but it's extremely efficient from a silicon area perspective. It's extremely low power and it's extremely flexible. The our ADC, for example, is configurable. There are actually two ADCs in there. There is a Sigma Delta ADC, which gives you a, 
very uh, very high dynamic range on one megahertz bandwidth and we have a pipeline adc which goes up to 20 megahertz bandwidth which is required when we do wi-fi demodulation so uh, it's actually a single adc which can be reconfigured uh, and uh, and then i'll talk a little bit more about the reconfigurable digital baseband when we talk about um you know the the mcu core so we have 256k of flash on that chip and 64k of ram but again this cannot be used to run your application. This is simply to run all our software-defined demodulation algorithm for Wi-Fi and for GPS and Baidu. Um, Nicola, I have a question about this. Yeah. Um, so you're showing here 2.4 gigahertz. Is that only for Wi-Fi or uh, would LoRa 2.4 gigahertz also be supported? Uh, you, you, um, I cannot answer this question right now. Of course, you know this would this would be really interesting, right? Uh, it's not supported for the moment. I think people know enough. Thank you. Um, the um, uh, so this chip is our um, is our best. You know, not only is it incredibly flexible, but it's our best sub gigahertz chip ever. So. Um, we have a dual on chip PA. Both PA, unlike 12 system, are available on the package. So you can you can have best of both worlds. You don't have to like between the 1261 and 62, you have to select which PA you're interested in. Here, both PA are routed to the package pins. We have a, a PA optimized for 14 dBm, 28 milliamp, but a 3.6 volt. And we have a, a brand new PA for the high power, 22 dBm, so more than 100 milliwatt, nearly 200 milliwatt out for 120 milliamp. This is very efficient PA, actually, uh, given the technology we are using, which is 19 nanometer. The slip current is less than 2 microamp with the RTC on. We're covering all sub gigahertz band from 100 megahertz to 1 gigahertz continuously. And we have the best ever. We have gained nearly 2 dB sensitivity in uh, LoRa mode compared to 1261. So we are now at uh, minus 141 dBm at SF12 125 kHz, measured 10% uh, packet error rate. So, so huge improvement in sensitivity, which is linked not to radio. It's linked to the new digital LoRa demodulator we've put in that chip. We have reworked the LoRa IP uh, uh, quite deeply uh, to improve, uh, you know, tracking capability, preamble detection capabilities. So there's a brand new LoRa IP in there, which has better sensitivity and better, you know, robustness. Uh, whenever we say software-defined radio, because that chip is essentially a software-defined radio, uh, we need, we say, uh, we, you need a highly reconfigurable digital basement which is the case. So actually here, we have, you know, our very programmable ADC, which can be either like a Sigma Delta or a pipeline ADC. We have a huge possibility in terms of, of you know, decimation and filtering in, uh, in that chain. So the result of that is we can basically um, down convert from 32 mega sample token to any arbitrary uh, sample rate from a few kilohertz as wide as uh, 20 megahertz and and really when i say arbitrary i really mean this uh, programmable dance sampler here we can make you know we can really output any sample rate we want so we have a tool here that lets us reconfigure the filtering and decimation chain exactly as we want to be able to listen to any signal we want in the future uh, now i'm going to spend uh, some time, quite some time on, on the GNSS pass. So this is one of the most, you know, uh, of course, exciting feature of that chip. Uh, we have taken a totally non-standard approach to, to GNSS or to GPS. So first, the chip as delivered today, the LR1110, is able to do dual constellation. So it, it can receive GPS and Beidou, L1 band only, so at 1.57 gigahertz. Uh, a a first, a very important feature is why are we stating two sensitivities here? We are stating a sensitivity of minus 134 dBm for strong signal SV capture or satellite capture and minus 141. So uh, you have to understand how the chip operates. The first thing the chip does is it assesses whether the satellite signal is strong enough to get a decent fix or not. To do this, we only need 0.65 seconds at an average of 7 milliamp. 
this is typically extremely useful because in a, in a normal use case, you, you have no idea when you do a GPS fix, whether you're going to be indoor or outdoor. If you indoor, this is useless. You're never going to get a proper GPS fix indoor with that chip. So basically, after 0 0.65 seconds, the chip decides if it's indoor, satellite is too weak, and drops it right there, or if the, if the signal condition is good enough to get a good fix. If that's the case, the chip will go on for another second, and will deliver uh, the pseudo ranges of eight satellites typically. So, if you outdoor, it's gonna in terms of energy, a GNSS fix is gonna cost you 1.65 second at six milliamp average. If the signal condition is too poor, the chip will drop after uh, only 0 0.65 second. So, to pass that first step, the chip needs to be able to detect at, at least one satellite above minus 134 uh, dBm which is you know, it's typically the case as soon as you are outdoor or even mild outdoor, as, as soon as you are close to a window. And then once the chip has passed this first step, this first verification step, it can go and grab satellites as low as minus 141 uh, dBm. Of course, this is not the you know best in class GPS uh, sensitivity. If you go to you know uh, to a, a, a traditional GPS receiver, you will see on the dash sheet sensitivities down to minus 160 dBm, etc. First, this is only when you are tracking. The chip is not designed for tracking at all. The use case for which this chip is designed is a, you know a GPS fix every hour or every six hours. So we are basically always in cold start. So you should really compare the Genesis receiver of that chip with the cold start mode, uh, cold start mode of a of a normal GPS uh, uh, receiver. Um, so given you compare it to a cold start mode, Zeus time here are absolutely quite amazing. Basically, that chip can be sleeping for days and days. You wake it up, and in 1.65 seconds, you have a GPS fix. Um, the Another thing which is important to, to understand is to be able to reach such low uh, fix time, the chip needs an up-to-date Almanac file. What is an Almanac? An Almanac is a data set that enable the chip to compute roughly where the satellites are in the sky at a given time. This is very important because you need to know, you know, wh which are the GPS satellite that are currently visible. That's very basic. And you need to be able to predict that Doppler uh, shift frequency to basically lower uh, the, the search base. To reduce the search base, you need to know around which frequency you have to search each satellite. So this is actually the service delivered by the Almanac. Uh, Almanac data is extremely small. Typically, we use less than 20 bytes per satellite. Uh, to to encode the almanac and the chip uh, uses roughly you know you have 32 up uh, you know 30 GPS satellite and about the same number of Beidou satellites so you have roughly 60 satellites each defined by 20 bytes in the chip so the total size of an almanac is le less than 1.5 kilobyte and an almanac file is valid basically three months after three months the offset between the you know predicted Doppler frequency and the actual Measure Doppler frequency becomes too big, and you can you start reducing the performance of the chip. You start to increase the current consumption or the time it takes to, to get a fix. Um, another consequence of the way we're doing this is the chip actually reports satellite pseudo range, but not a latitude and longitude. It's not a classical GPS receiver. It, it's totally enabled to compute where it is. It actually only delivers a bunch of pseudo range. You take this bunch of pseudo range, you put them in a LoRa one frame, and then you push that to our GNSS solver cloud service. And from that bunch of pseudo range, the cloud solver will be able to deliver a latitude, a longitude, and an altitude. But the chip itself cannot do that because the chip doesn't have access to ephemerates. The chip cannot compute accurately what the GPS satellites are, only very roughly based on Almanac. Only the cloud side knows in real time where the satellites are precisely and is therefore able to do the final computation of latitude, longitude, altitude. So in summary, uh, this, this GNS path on the, on, the, on the chip it behaves very differently from a classical GPS receiver. It's extremely low power and efficient. It can be brought from you know deep sleep to a fix in, in less than two seconds. 
it's designed for a position fix every few hours, not at all for continuous tracking. This is not a one Earth GPS tracker at all. If you want this, go buy a U-Blox chip. Okay. Uh, it needs an up-to-date Almanac file. When I say up-to-date, less than three, month, three months old. And very important, it does not deliver latitude longitude on chip. It delivers a set of pseudo range that need to be pushed into a cloud solver to get latitude longitude. Was that, was that clear, Johan? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. So I'm now going to go to the Wi-Fi pass of the chip. So, um, the... Uh, um, Declan, I do have a question about this. Yeah, so okay. uh, power consumption is really important. Can you say something about, uh, I got a question from Frank on the chat, uh, about uh, the battery the power consumption for updating the Almanac? Okay. So, um, you can update Almanac in a variety of ways. The, Alm the complete Almanac file, so roughly 1.5 kilobytes, can be provided by the host MCU nearly instantly through the SPI. The SPI is like 5 megabit per second. That's a matter of less, less than millisecond, right? And the host MCU itself can get access to the Almanac file whenever you have a BLE connection or a USB connection or whatever. Yeah, a, a lot of trackers out there, they have a BLE uh, link to a phone from time to time. So every time you have a BLE link, you can you can you can download the latest Almanac file and push it to server. That's nearly, you know, doesn't burn any battery at all. If you do the Almanac update over LoRa One, this is gonna represent. So uh, this is this Almanac update over LoRa One is one of the services that our cloud will deliver, and this is gonna be the equivalent of one downlink per week. So it's extremely low overhead in terms of energy. So as a, you know, an order of magnitude, what you should remember is keeping the Almanac up to date is going to represent one downlink per week. Does that answer the question? Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, so I'm now going to come into the, the Wi-Fi demodulator. So first, this is not, you have to understand, this is not a true Wi-Fi, it's enabled to transmit. You're not gonna, you're never gonna connect to an access point with this Wi-Fi path. It's only a Wi-Fi receiver, and it's only for geolocation purposes. So what it does is you trigger a Wi-Fi scan, and it will report a list of access point MAC address with the RSSI. And once you have this list of MAC address and RSSI, you can push that in the cloud to any Wi-Fi lookup database, and Semtech will provide one, but you may decide to use another one, and this Wi-Fi lookup database service transforms this list of MAC address into a position or an address or anything. Okay, we um, Wi-Fi geolocation works extremely well. It's the lowest power geolocation you have out there after you know uh, 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 geolocation by the network and uh, through LoRa TDOA or just uh, uh, LoRa gateway uh, uh, positioning. But it it gives you roughly 30 meter accuracy in less than 80 milliseconds at 12 milliamp. So it's extremely fast. Therefore, it's very efficient in terms of power. It works in urban environment. It works indoor, outdoor, nearly everywhere. So basically, before even attempting GPS positioning, you should probably try to do a Wi-Fi scan because this is really a lot more energy efficient. And the precision is actually now nowadays extremely good because we have a lot of access point out there. Uh, a few limitations on this chip, we only scan 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi signal. We do not have 5 gigahertz possibilities here. Uh, however, at 2.4 gigahertz, we are able to scan all possible modulation. So we are able to demodulate 802.11b, G, and N uh, signals. Okay. Uh, again, like GPS, that doesn't give you a position on the chip. It gives you a list of MAC address that you push to the cloud into a Wi-Fi lookup service that gives you back a position. Okay, clear for you, Jan? Clear for me, yes. Okay, um, a, a final feature of the chip is, you know, security. So uh, LR1110 comes equipped with a cryptographic engine. So we don't call it a secure element because it hasn't been certified as a real, you know, banking grade secure element, but it's, everything is included in hardware. It has a fully separate and secure storage memory for the keys. Everything, you know, full hardware AES 128 engine. All LoRa 1 key derivation are implemented in hardware. Okay, so it's basically designed that once you can write a key in there, but you can never read it back. 
you know? So the secure engine comes pre-provisioned from Semtech factory with default app keys and network key, which are, you know, uh, different for every devices, but that, which have been injected by Semtech. And those keys are available in the associated joint server uh, cloud service. However, you're not obliged to use them. If you can replace them with your own keys without degrading the security of the entire scheme, you know, you can overwrite in production, overwrite the keys with your own keys in there and use all the key derivation exactly like you would do with the default Semtech keys. Um, a fine, so this and all, you know, all LoRa one encryption, decryption, the key duration, every, you know, all the LoRa one key handling is natively handled by that, say, uh, that cryptographic engine. A final work about how you connect to our cloud service. So, um, first, join request. You know, the join request, the the uh, the LoRa, LoRa alliance has defined a standard interface between a join server and the uh, LoRa network server. Uh, so in that case, we have simply implemented exactly the standard LoRa Alliance joint server interface. So your join request will flow from the chip to the Semtech joint server if you decide to use the Semtech joint server, which will generate a join accept, which will flow back to the LoRa one server and back to the chip. Okay. For geolog purposes, once you want to route, uh, you know, list of MAC address for the Wi-Fi scan or a list of pseudo range in case of a GNSS uh, scan, this is all in the, like, the application layer. So basically, this is actually, um, um, this, this payload is actually uh, transported through a normal LoRaWAN application payload. Therefore, it flies through the LNS, through the LoRaWAN network server. It, land in, it lands on your application server, and the application server is responsible to forward it to Semtech Cloud Service through an HTTPS uh, interface. So uh, that basically means that first, Semtech doesn't own your app key at all. You're responsible to decrypt your payloads as a user. We will never intercept your payload. You only forward it to us if you want and when you want. There is no way we can intercept your your traffic. Okay. So whenever you receive a GNSS frame from one of your chip, for example, you will simply forward it through an HTTP request to our, our geolog services and we will answer back with a latitude, longitude, altitude uh, information. Okay, but it's, it's again, I repeat, we are not putting ourselves between the chip and you. The data is coming to your application server and you decide, and only if you decide to forward it to us, can we do something about it. And we don't own your app key, you're responsible to decrypt your uh, application traffic. So just to put this in perspective, um, so people maybe also in the call are used to, uh, you know, the Things Network console. Um, uh, so you will be able to configure the Semtech uh, cloud services as an integration in in the in the TTN console. Exactly, because in the, and in that case, the decryption of the payload is happening inside the the console, and and the decrypted payload is actually forwarded to to our cloud services. Okay, I have another question. The, yeah. are, are, it is also the uh, uh, it's, it, it question just come in from uh, 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 Juan. Um, is is also the fine timestamps uh, part of the equation or no? Fine timestamp meaning like the gateway fine timestamp. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, okay. So um, I think so. Th there is already one technology available for geolocation of LoRa devices, which has nothing to do with the device itself. It's purely a network-centric geolocation uh, um, solution, which is based on differential time of arrival of a given LoRa packet on various gateways. So when the gateways have the capability to perform, to find timestamp the time of arrival of a LoRa packet, by comparing the timestamp of at least three gateways, you are able to compute the position of the device who transmitted that LoRa packet. That technology is it applies when it's available. It applies to any LoRa one device, not just LR eleven ten. So um, those are two totally independent things. You know, the LR eleven ten we have a device centric geolocation capability through uh, GNSS and Wi-Fi scanning, but of course. Every time the LR1110 transmits a LoRaWAN frame, any LoRaWAN frame, not just GPS and Wi-Fi, like 
you know, just a regular modem status frame, this frame might be localized by the network if the network is equipped to do fine time stamping. So they are like complementary if you want. Perfect, thanks. More than welcome. Um, was there anything? So, um, yeah, so, so, so really as a summary, uh, um, I'd like to say that basically this is a, a, a chip very different from what we used to do or from the, the previous transceiver chip. Uh, it has a lot more potential, a lot more processing power on board. Nonetheless, it's still extremely low power. Uh, it implements a, a, a very efficient uh, GNSS receiver, but which operates fundamentally differently from a classical GNSS receiver. So it's hard to compare it egg to egg with another, uh, uh, you know, um, standard GNSS receiver. And it's definitely not designed for one hertz tracking. You know, if you want to do pedestrian tracking with that, it's, it's probably not a good option. It's really meant for logistic and asset tracking where you want to fix every hour or every six hour or just on demand uh, maybe and it implements two complementary geolocation technologies one is wi-fi scanning which works extremely well indoor and outdoor in dense urban environment and a gnss receiver which is designed to operate outdoor in areas where actually wi-fi scanning cannot operate and this is why we have implemented those two complementary technologies as you know where where GNSS doesn't work, there is a very high probability that Wi-Fi works extremely well, and where Wi-Fi doesn't, doesn't work well, uh, very good probability that the GPS receiver will, will work optimally. All of this in a, in a single chip. Great. Um, we have time for a few questions. Uh, Nicola, do you have any other slides, or uh, can we no, go to no, questions? No, I have reached the end of my slide, and I'm really okay. uh, happy to answer any questions. Yes, great. So, um, <clears throat> one question that's uh, asked a few times already, um, and that is uh, about the solver. So, uh, we already um, discussed this briefly in the in the chat, um, and you said you know the solver is uh, is a is a Semtex service. It's proprietary. Uh, but the protocol is um, it's uh, it's not encrypted. You can you yes. can write your own yeah. solver if you want. Uh, but you also said that that is quite challenging. Yes. Um, is there would it be possible to um, license your solver solution and run that on premises? And um, the the reason to do this uh, would be, for example, data privacy uh, to not um, you know make uh, Semtex services aware of all the device locations. Uh, but it may also be infrastructure constraints. You know that you cannot uh, rely on an external cloud service. So can you can you license your solver and run it on premises? I know uh, this is uh, uh, not available uh, yet. Uh, but of course, this is on our mind. So I cannot, uh, I cannot give you any schedule for that. But uh, but of course, this is this request has already uh, been. Uh, you know, we have already had this request for many different uh, customer we have already interacted with, and we know this. We will have at one point to deliver uh, such a solution, because in its run on the edge, because of data privacy because of intermittent internet access all the reason you gave are actually uh, actually good reason initially we don't want to offer this because we prefer to have a centralized instance because we know uh, we're going to have we probably going to have to do rapid iteration on it to improve it to fix uh, you know bugs etc so during for initial operation we prefer to keep a centralized instance to be able to upgrade it as often as required, and as soon as things will have stabilized, and you know will have good performance across the board, uh, uh, then it will be time to start uh, really thinking about this. Okay, thanks. Um, so, is the LR eleven ten is that really designed for tracking? Um, so, we, because you you covered uh, uh, geolocation in extent, um, or um, uh, can you also use it in devices that don't need to do any geolocation? Or would you say, you know, this is really designed for devices that need to be Hello. aware of the location? Of, so, of course, you know, typically once you have an, uh, a modem LR1110, it's a very compelling, you know, everything in a cheap, uh, you know, modem solution. Uh, however, it, it's just, 
there is no technical limitation. Of course, of course, you you are ne you never have to use the geolocation capabilities of LR11 then, and you can use it simply to connect to a LoRa1 network. It's just a price problem. Uh, might be maybe if you're just using it uh, as a modem, you will find that it might be it may be a little bit more expensive than just an SX1261 or 62 based solution with a small MCU on the side. So okay. it's simply a pricing problem. It's not there is nothing that prevents you to use it just as a modem. It's simply that uh, if you're not using the geolocation functionalities, you might find it's a little bit too expensive. All right. That's clear. Um, another question. Can you go back to the um, uh, to the schematic uh, slide that you had? Of course. You mean the us this one here, for example? Um, no, with the, the radio. The radios. Yes. Okay. This, this one. one. Yeah. Um, so there was a question about this, and um, uh, one question was, uh, so how many antennas do you need? So you, you're, okay. we're operating yeah. in different bands, and so there's sub gigahertz, there's 2.4 gigahertz. Does that mean that um, uh, you need, uh, let's say, four different antennas, or no? I don't. So, uh, you, so the, uh, the, if you want all the functionalities, you basically have three antennas. You have a GNSS antenna for uh you know centered around 1.57 gigahertz uh, um, and we strongly recommend to have a very low noise amplifier on the pcb to improve the sensitivity of the gnss receiver you have a 2.4 gigahertz antenna for wi-fi scanning and you have your 868 or 915 or 470 megahertz uh, uh lora one antenna for a sub gigahertz uh, network uh, communication However, you can have some very clever trick. We have device manufacturers out there, partners, which manage to do, you know, a uh, dual band antenna, which is both your LoRa antenna, so you have an 868 megahertz antenna, and a GPS antenna. So you might have devices, for example, where you have only two antennas. In effect, a 2.4 gigahertz antenna, which can be extremely small. It can be like as small as a grain of rice, basically, if you're using a ceramic antenna. Uh, and, and a PCB antenna, which acts both as your... LoRa1 antenna, sub gigahertz antenna, and your GPS antenna. Uh, there are many configurations possible out there. Uh, some devices will probably have more than three antenna because they want to implement uh, GPS antenna diversity. So they may have, you know, two GPS antennas, uh, depending on the orientation of the device, a 2.4 gigahertz antenna, and a sub gig antenna. Uh, it's really hard to predict and it's very use case specific. Okay. I have a, we have um, uh, around a minute left, two minutes left, and then we go to uh, another presentation. So two uh, a quick yes-no questions. One is, does, uh, does it support LoRaWAN 1.1 or 1.0.4? And uh, if not, will it support it? Oh, so first, the LR1110 is a transceiver. So of course it supports any version of LoRaWAN because the stack is on the host MCU as it is right now. OK, there may be a modem version of that in the future. And in that case, uh, the data sheet of that of that modem version will tell you which version it supports. Yeah, and this was about the modem version. OK, so when the, uh, sure. OK, um, so as the, the it's, uh, of course, host MCU that needs to, uh, that does the LoRaWAN uh, bits. And then a final question uh, from uh, Tajib about uh, usage for metering. Um, okay. So that's uh, that's going to be fine, right? Just frequent um, frequent uh, data transmission without geolocation. You can use this chip for it, that. It's right. exactly. It's you know. It's uh, of course that chip can do everything you used to do with a 1261 or 1272 and simply more. But everything yeah. you used to do with a previous transceiver, you can do with that chip, of course. Right. And also that also means any of the LoRaWAN regions. Uh, Yes, that's yes. just the it's, same. Yeah, okay. simply, you know, better efficiency in transmit and better sensitivity in receive. It's simply a better sub gigahertz chip. Yeah, okay. Great. Thanks, Nicolas, very much um, for your presentation and uh, also for your flexibility uh, for the technical issues that we had. Um, you can stop sharing and then um, we now go to the presentation from uh, Benjamin. So thank you so much, guys. Uh, wish everybody a good day of conference, and I'm going to go and get myself a coffee. <laughs> well deserved, well deserved. Uh, I, I hear an applause. Uh, 